All right, we are in 1 Peter chapter 2. Last week we got to verse 9. We discussed the concept of being a chosen generation, uh, both the chosen aspect as well as being a, as Peter speaks to this uh, era of Christians all the way to us and through us, uh, the idea of being a, a generation of people who have access to the plan of God uh, seems to be a particular aspect of what he's describing. A royal priesthood, we talked about the, the different, kind of almost contradictory nature of those terms in regard to the old law, but in the new law, we are royal priests. Uh, we are both heirs with Christ as king, and also we, he as high priest, we are part of that priesthood. And we are a holy nation in contrast to what often Israel uh, and later on Israel and Judah uh, often refused to serve God and do what, as he commanded, those who are of God are to be holy. And that's one of the, the characteristics that Peter described back in First Peter, that we are to be holy as he is holy and taking on those characteristics of the Father. His own special people, King James has his own peculiar people, um, what does this mean, that we're his own special people? In fact, uh, Paul uses the same term to Titus when he writes to Titus about how to be zealous for good works. In what way are we his own special people? How, how does this differentiate between chosen generation, royal priesthood, holy nation, and then Peter describes us as his own special people? It's interesting because this term, I, I was looking at it just a minute ago, this term is associated with the concept of acquisition or possession. And it's the idea that it's not just that God uh, has acquired us, he's purchased us. Okay? We have been purchased with the blood of his son. Uh, not that to a certain extent Israel, he didn't you know, possess Israel, certainly he, he did to a certain extent, but we are different, Christians are different in that because we have been made clean and holy, not through the blood of bulls and goats, but through the blood of Jesus, we have been acquired, we've been redeemed. And it is to that that Peter is, is kind of suggesting here, implying, regarding being a special people. This is something that great sacrifice, great payment was made in order to acquire. And as a result, that makes us special to God. Uh, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. A very kind of almost poetic in the way Peter describes. In essence, what is he describing regarding the second who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light? In a word, what is Peter describing? Darkness, light, sin versus salvation. Okay, that's what Peter's describing. But the, the way in which he does it, the terms that he uses, is, it, it, not only is it beautiful in its poetic nature, but also its, its imagery is very distinct. When he says, he called you out of darkness. Okay, all those who are in sin in the New Testament are considered to be in darkness. In second, our first John chapter 1 uh, the concept that John gives is walking in darkness is having a life of sin versus walking in the light as he is in the light, walking the, the path that God has given to us. The idea of calling us out of darkness, it's as if we're in a dark room and we have no idea where we're going. And then God speaks. Okay, it's kind of this imagery here. And with his hearing his speech, we know which, how to get out of this room of darkness and into the light. How does God call us? How is God calling all people in sin? Through the gospel. Through the gospel. Okay. Sometimes we, we sing the hymn, ring out the message, or ring, uh, ring out the, what's the hymn called? Ring out the, ring the, ring the message out. Thank you. Ring the message out. It, it's that gospel call uh, that calls forth for anyone in sin to understand how to be saved. And that gospel is calling to all those who are lost in the darkness. They're just kind of feeling around. They don't know where they are. They don't know where they're going, whether they know it or not. And so as a result, he's called us into his marvelous light. 
Okay, and certainly light and dark, there's that sense in which now we can see clearly, and now we have understanding, and now we are serving God. Certainly that's part of that marvelous light. But there's also that sense of that, that glory that's associated with it. Uh, and as a result of that great change, what does Peter say we're to be doing? Proclaim. Huh? Proclaim. proclaim. Yeah, we are to proclaim the praises of him. Are we to proclaim those praises uh, of him to him? Sure, right? Do we proclaim praises of him to him? Do we thank him when we offer up hymns? Do we thank him when we pray? Okay, certainly we proclaim the praises of him to him, but then what's the other aspect of that? To whom else do we talk about and proclaim how wonderful God is? Yeah. Not only our brethren, which we do in the process of, for instance, when we sing and make melody in our hearts to the Lord, but also among our neighbors, our friends, our co-workers, and so forth. We proclaim those praises, which means, are we going to be, by nature, different than those who live a life contrary to God's word? Just, just by, not only by our nature and our character, are we going to be different than those who live a life that is of sin, but our, our focus is different in that what we talk about, what we find of value to, to discuss with people is going to be different. Okay? Whereas other people want to talk about you know, all the, the excitement they had over the weekend at this party, you're getting drunk or whatever. We want to talk about, for instance, what might we talk about our weekend? What lesson we may have learned, right, in Bible study or in our, our sermon or what we, did, you know, what we did in worship. Some aspect to that component of praising God, that's what's of value to us. And rather than trying to fit in or, or try to, try to uh, kind of be part of that, that, what the world would term kind of that, that cool crowd of, of describing our life as they do, Instead, we are a special people. We're different. And that's what we're called to be. That's what we should be. Although, of course, that temptation is always there for us to, to kind of uh, shirk or, or, or back out from being different from everybody else. Yes, ma'am? The word adopted comes to mind for yep. me. And, uh, you know, everybody thinks their children are the most beautiful, which is, they should, right? <laughs> but if you've ever adopted children... They become as beautiful as your biological children to you. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of kids in foster care out there, and I know a family in Kansas City that now have, they are Caucasian. They have three adult Caucasian biological children, but now they also have five African-American children. Wow. And if you've ever been through the adoption process uh, of foster children, it is not an easy road. You know, you think about the price that God paid, they've paid financially, emotionally, physically, <coughs> everything to be able to adopt these children just because of the situation with the biological mother. Wow. And so it's a long, long, drawn out process. And so when we were first going through this, it made me think about the struggles of, uh, and the price that we pay on earth to be able to help children yeah. and raise them in a God-fearing home. Um, and, and that's another way that we, we are different. Sure. Is because we are adopted, but he loves us as if we were his biological children. Sure. Yeah, Gal uh, Galatians, cha or Galatians chapter 4. Yeah, Galatians chapter 4 deals with being adopted as sons. Yes, ma'am. As a personal note, I always said if biological parents had to meet the same qualifications that adoptive parents had to meet, there wouldn't be very many children in the world. Yeah, that's, that's true. Right. Yeah, it's that's very, true. It's very difficult to adopt a child. Yeah. All right, anything else through verse 9? All right, so going into verse 10, he's describing this contrast of what we as Christians once were to what we are now. And that's why he says, and of course, now we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, as opposed to before, in particular, the Gentiles were none of those things. 
Now, the Jews, to a certain extent, yes, they had a priesthood. It wasn't a royal one. Yes, they were a nation of God, but not always holy. Yes, they were chosen from, you know, because of the promises of Abraham, but not chosen as we are. Uh, and, of course, Israel was always supposed to proclaim the praises of him, but they didn't always. But notice, we have been called out of darkness to his marvelous light. We once were not a people but are now the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. From both a Jewish and a Gentile perspective, this is going to be true regardless. But perhaps more so even as Gentiles, because when he describes you once were not a people, but are now the people of God. Well, from a certain extent, the Israel was the people. They were the people of God. Okay? That was the nation of God before. And so this is part of, of how Peter is including not just Jewish Christians in what he describes. Although certainly, as we've already noted, there have been certain uh, aspects that he's brought out that have applied in particular to the Jewish Christians. But verse 10, I mean, this is uh, almost to a certain extent, it's, it's almost Gentile oriented. Because a Jew would say, no, we were the people of God, but not this special people you weren't. And that's what he's describing. You had not obtained mercy to a, a certain extent under the old law, but the concepts of mercy were different than they are obviously under the new law. But ultimately, what aspect or, or what ultimate demonstration of mercy is Peter alluding to? What's the ultimate demonstration of the mercy of God? Forgiveness of sins. That, that is, and of course, the forgive, that forgiveness of sins could not be obtained under the old law. Those sins were covered, okay, but they were not forgiven. And the, the concept of forgiven in the Old Testament is a different, it's defined differently than it is in the New Testament. And so this concept applies both to Jews and to Gentiles. None of us. In fact, in some ways, it's reminiscent of Romans 3.23, which says what? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, both, in fact, Paul, within that context of chapter 3, is describing how both the Gentiles and the Jews, that's, this is why we all needed a Savior. And to a certain extent, Peter's doing the same thing here in verse 10. Thoughts or comments through verse 10. All right. So, being really the first half of chapter 2 deals with the nature of, of the Christian, the, the different aspects of being uh, a part of this priesthood, of being holy, of because we're all built on Christ, because Christ's characteristics are such uh, as being holy and righteous, ours should be as well. So then he starts applying this here in verse 11. He says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul very first thing he describes, he says, well, the very first thing he says, beloved, and that he loves them. But the second thing he describes is the sojourners and pilgrims. In what way are they physical sojourners and pilgrims? Is that kind of what he's describing? Because we talked about chapter one, he describes the pilgrims of the dispersion. And we discussed that, that this might not necessarily be a physical representation, but more of a spiritual one, certainly about Christians. Christians being dispersed through the world, and certainly Christians in these areas in particular being uh, among those in the world. But now he describes here in verse 11, sojourners and pilgrims. Verse 1, chapter 1, dispersion. What's he describing here in verse 11? Is it talking about our trip on earth versus going down heaven? I think that's exactly what he's describing. Hebrews 11 and in verse 13. Can somebody read for me Hebrews 11 and in verse 13? Whoever gets there first. Hebrews 11, uh, really verses 11 through 13, if you would, please. 11 through 13. Whoever's there. By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life since she considered a faithful good promised. Therefore, there was born even of one man 
and him as good as dead at that time, as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number, <coughs> and innumerable as the sands which is by the seashore. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them, and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed them, confess that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. And read verse 14 also, please. For those who are, say such things, make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. Okay. That chapter of faith, especially as it culminates with Abraham and Sarah, he describes these individuals who were willing to follow God and do as he said because they believed in him. They believed he was able to fulfill the promises that he gave them. And as a result, there in verse 13, they were willing to confess that they were strangers and, and sojourners. They were individuals who were traveling, okay? but where is their ultimate home? Heaven, that's their ultimate home. That, that's where they, their ultimate goal is. And, and in a lot of ways, the, the chapter of faith there in Hebrews chapter 11 describes the inward goal that, they, that these individuals have. Okay, Moses, he considered the, the uh, riches of Egypt as nothing compared to the reward in Christ Jesus. That's why the Hebrew, he says, for he looked to the reward. Okay, these, they all look beyond. They had a, a, a sight that went beyond the temporary to the eternal. And this concept carries with it there in verse 11, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, this is not from a physical perspective. There's no reason to think that he was specifically addressing only Christians in those regions who were somehow physically displaced from their homes. That, that there's nothing that suggests that. This is a spiritual representation of the fact that from a spiritual perspective, we're displaced from our home. And our goal of where we're heading back is heaven. That's why he says, as sojourners and pilgrims, this being the case, what's the contrast to being a sojourner and a pilgrim? Sorry? Permanent dwelling. Thank you. Yeah, permanent dwelling. Yes, permanent dwelling. Establishing a, a, a base here. Remember when Israel was commanded by God as they were going through the wilderness and how often he told them not to stay in one place for too long, not to intermingle with the other peoples around them. But then time and time again, they did so. And it caused major problems for Israel. Okay, in a lot of ways, even throughout the New Testament, that sojourning in the wilderness is kind of somewhat paralleled with regard to the Christian walk getting to the promised land, so to speak, which is heaven for us. And this idea of being sojourners and pilgrims, it, that's, this is opposed to having a permanent dwelling or, to that extent, having our mind focused here and now as opposed to having what Paul would describe as the helmet of salvation. Okay, looking forward to that, that redemption, that ultimate day of going to heaven. And so this is why he contrasts as sojourners and pilgrims instead of yielding to fleshly lusts, which don't war against the flesh. Instead, he says, abstain from fleshly lusts, which do war against the soul. Because this is that contrast that he's making. If we establish our home here, and we say, I'm not interested in anything else. I want to enjoy my life now. You only have one life to live. Might as well live it up. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. This is the contrast that Peter's painting. That as Christians, we can't have that mindset. We can't have that attitude. Because our goal is heaven. And if we want to get there, then we have to abstain from fleshly lusts. But notice how he uses this term, it wars. Okay? Which war against the soul. Why does he... Why does he use that term, a war against the soul? It's a spiritual war. Okay. Satan is trying to defeat us, defeat anything we do to lead others to Christ, and he's also ultimately wanting us to be with him eternally, which is not going to be a good thing. It's not going to be joy and celebration. It's so almost to a certain extent, in addition to the uh, imagery of being a sojourner or a pilgrim, a traveler, in addition to that, what else are we? 
or soldiers, right? And, and that this battle is taking place not in the world so much as it's taking place within the person. The physical versus the spiritual. Paul acknowledged that on, on several occasions, that these are constantly fighting one another. And this is why when Peter describes to abstain from fleshly lusts, when I yield to that, what happens to the soul? It gets, put, it gets pushed away. It gets harmed. It's harmed. There's conflict as opposed to supporting my soul, which, as Jesus told us, that's the most important thing we have. You know, what else? What can a man profit? If he gains the whole world but loses his own soul. Yes, ma'am. I don't have any combat experience except through movies, but it seems like soldiers can't ever let their guard down. Yeah. Even when they're, say, on R&R, they still have, they still carry with them. You know, if we look at Uriah, he knew his men were out on the battlefield. He still didn't let his guard down, yeah. even though he was pulled from the front line. And so it's a matter of always keeping your guard up, because if you go on R&R &R and you let your guard down as a spiritual being, yeah. that's when all kinds of things can creep in and attack you. You know, it's interesting because two different passages came to mind when you talked about that. One of them is 2 Timothy chapter 2, where Paul tells Timothy that a soldier of Christ, uh, a soldier doesn't entangle himself in the affairs of this life so that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. In the middle of a battle, you don't just sit there and start, you know, checking your fantasy football team. You know, it, you're focused on the battle. Uh, in addition... Um, <laughs> uh, what was the other one? Oh man, this went out of my head. Anyway, uh, that concept of uh, the fleshly lusts warring against the soul, I was, ta I was thinking about my uh, father-in-law also. As a, ah, I remember now, uh, as a police officer, he's even now, he's retired, but even now, he kind of looks for a corner booth. You know, when we go, if we go out to eat, you know, there, there's always that caution, not that he's suspicious or that he's paranoid, but it's his training. And thinking about that reminds me of Ephesians chapter five, where Paul tells the Ephesians that we must walk circumspect. Okay, we must be aware of ourselves and aware of our surroundings so that we know when temptation, when sin might crop up because it could come up at any point. And so even though, you know, my, my father-in-law is retired, he still has that that training as a police officer where he's always kind of always on guard in his mind. He's always, that training just kind of kicks in and takes over. That's how we're supposed to be as Christians. And that's, we're to be aware of ourselves, circumspect, and certainly not entangling ourselves in the affairs of this life from the perspective of it, of it grabbing us and keeping us here. That, that's, that's the idea. Not, not that we don't have connections here in this world. We do. We have responsibilities. We have relationships. But entangled means to be entrapped as if I can't go and do my job as a soldier because I'm sitting here texting so-and-so or I'm doing this or that. Any else, anything else through verse 11? Verse 12. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. All right, so is he only writing to Jews then? If he describes that having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, is he only describing, in what way is he describing, is he using the term Gentiles? Because Paul does the same thing on several occasions. He references Gentiles. What does he mean when they say Gentiles? They say, well, all the Jews, you don't have to be honorable among the Jews? What does Peter mean? Okay, the world or the godless. Okay, and to a certain extent, even the Jews, even though they attempted to follow the old law, they weren't. They were no longer serving Jehovah. They they were they had rejected the Messiah. They were not serving Jehovah anymore. So, from a broad perspective, even when Paul would refer to uh, our minds, uh, or is that Ephesians chapter two, uh, not being like the Gentiles and so forth. Uh, 
and then we've spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, 1 Peter chapter 4. This concept of godlessness, of sinfulness, is what's being represented here. It's not that uh, he's only speaking to Jews, and it's not that we don't have to have our conic honorable among the Jews. It's this sense in which all those who are not serving God, this is what we need to make sure we do. Yes, ma'am? Well, if we replace the word Gentiles with the word world, yeah. and we're talking to us, Having your conduct honorable among the world. Yes. That when they speak again, it doesn't say if they speak again you, against you. Mm -hmm. It's a given that if your conduct is honorable among the world, people are going to talk against you. That's, yeah. And we need to be ready for that. Well, and isn't it interesting that what did he just finish talking about with regard to Jesus uh, being rejected by men, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense? <coughs> Remember last week we talked about that. By association, therefore, are we going to be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense because we're trying to be or just because of what we represent? Okay, it's not that we're trying to be. It's not that we're trying to be mean to people or offend people. It's just that that's the nature of the teaching of Christ. And by association, that's the nature of the example of one who serves Christ is that it's going to be offensive to people. That's just the way it is. And so the verse 12 goes hand in hand with that concept that our conduct needs to be honorable among the Gentiles, that, as you mentioned, as when they speak against you as evildoers. Remember, we, we even discussed this in our Wednesday night study in the, the history of the church. Going back, we looked at some of the great persecutions that arose against Christians and how often there were false claims. I mean, these weren't legitimate claims. They were false claims or they were uh, deliberately misconstrued actions or words by Christians that were then made out to be completely something else than what was intended or what was meant. And so that idea of being evildoers, to a certain extent, wasn't Jesus accused of being an evildoer? By the Jews regarding the old law, what did they often accuse him of doing? Stirring up riots. Stirring up riots, of breaking the Sabbath, of calling himself God. Okay, and even to the Jews when it came to Rome, what did they attempt to tell Pilate? He's a threat to you. He claims to be a king. And if, you're, uh, if you are, are, are choosing the side of this man, you're no friend of Caesar's. And they painted it as if Jesus was attempting to create this physical kingdom. And there's nothing that suggests that the Jews actually believed that. In fact, if anything, they didn't want Jesus for the fact that he wasn't what he, uh, they wanted him to be. And so all of these claims of evil doing, and of course Peter's going to get on to describing the fact that if we suffer because we have done evil, okay, is that, is that, is that to be expected? Should we be suffering for doing evil? We shouldn't, well, I mean, you know, that, that's to be expected, but should we be doing evil by which we, should, we suffer? We shouldn't be doing evil, that's, and that's the point. But here he describes a life of people who live according to what God has said, and yet they're rejected. So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe. Notice they're observing, not just, they're not just hearing your words. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. It's kind of a phrase sometimes we hear. And, and a lot of times, our words, you know, that's, our, you can say one thing as much as you want to, it doesn't make it true. But what does make it true is actually practicing what we preach, actually living what we say we're supposed to be. And this is what Peter's describing here. So when Peter says, uh, honorable conduct, and this goes to question four of our notes. In what way should our conduct be honorable, and what will this automatically include and not include? So in what way should our conduct be honorable? But let's, let's, let's look at it this way. By whose definition? What definition of honorable should our conduct be? God's definition, okay? Because man's definition of honorable may not be in accordance with God. The standard that Peter's establishing here has nothing to do with man's standard. It has to do with God's standard. 
Now, that being the case, certainly we have the standard of righteousness, that which is right and that which is wrong, that we adhere to, and that's part of our, our honorable conduct. But as it specifically pertains to people who aren't Christians, what actions or, or what things should be a part of our conduct and what shouldn't be a part of our conduct as it pertains to our friends and neighbors? In what way should that honorable conduct be shown to others? Okay, kind of refer to it as the golden rule. It's Christ's rule. You know, ultimately, paraphrasing, treat others as you want to be treated. Okay, this is how you should live your life as you talk to others and you uh, react to others as you would hope that they would treat you, talk to you, and react to you. All right, treating people with respect, treating people with kindness, uh, with long suffering. Okay, those are all characteristics that need to be a part of our everyday character. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I, I think maybe uh, honorable. First off. God's definition of honorable doesn't change, but man's definition of honorable has changed in my lifetime. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and the other thing is, is, to me, honorable would be not how I want someone to treat me, but how did Christ treat people? Yeah. Because he always treated people with respect and kindness, but he stood strong in the, in the truth. And yeah. He delivered it with love. And well, and at times, tough love. love. Right? Yeah. When, when called for, there was even times of tough love. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, the first things that came to my mind were, were uh, how I dress and how I speak and, you know, those kinds of things. Your neighbors, your, your friends are going to see that. What you stand up for as far as going to the movies or, um, you know, things you, you do in your home. Yeah. People see that stuff. Yeah. Um, and... <clears throat> And so, to me, we want to honor to God by our behavior, um, and, and our, especially our behavior to others. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's focusing on that, that concept of the Gentiles observing us. Okay, they can't observe, and, and they're, you know, most Gentile, Gentile, most people who aren't Christians, they're not going to be here in worship with us to observe us at worship. All right. They're going to see us when we're in the world. They're going to see us when we're at work, when we're at school, when we're at Walmart, when we're at Market Street, when we're at the gas station. These are the places that we go. This is part of our, our social construct. We go to the, uh, to the, the restaurant to go eat. Okay. People see us there. So, for instance, would us uh, bowing our heads and saying a prayer for a meal at a restaurant, would that be honorable conduct? Yes. Sure. Now, people may not appreciate it. There may be some who, you know, atheists or whatever, who don't appreciate that. But is, is it, is that, should I therefore not do it? Is that what Peter's describing? That I need to appease people? No. It's the conduct that is honorable that shows forth what God has told us to do. And so at the very least, even though these atheists may not respect the fact that we're praying for our food, at the very least, what can they say? Or, I guess I said, what can't they say? What are, what are we saying by our very act of praying for our food? That we believe in God. We believe in God. We recognize that he's the one who's blessed us. And as a result, that example, will, that's, that's there. I mean, I've, I've personally been a part of, of occasions where I've been with a group of preachers. We have got together and, and had a meal. We prayed. We talked Bible got up and found out somebody already paid for our meal because they appreciated the fact that we were sitting there talking about the Bible. This has happened on numerous occasions uh, for many of our brethren. I'm sure some of you even had this happen or heard of it happening for you, where people respect that and they appreciate the fact that you get together, you study the Bible, whatever, you pray for your food. They may come and, and shake your hand or whatever, that they appreciate that. And that's happened. There are people who see that. And you wouldn't think that that would be something that would stand out to people, but it does to certain people. And this is part of that honorable conduct among the Gentiles, that we're not hypocrites. Okay, that's a, we're going to talk this morning about reasons why people reject going to, to some kind of a religious institution, reject Christianity, and reject organized religion, because it, at least in some of their experiences that they kind of paint blanketly, they think that all Christians are hypocrites. 
And certainly we don't want to add to that impression. We want to be the opposite of that. Or self-righteous. What does it mean to be self-righteous? People get accused of being self-righteous. In my head, it means that I think I'm better than other people. Okay, better in that somehow my deeds or my uh, life is better than others somehow because I've made it better. Okay, it's not the idea that, uh, well, God through Christ Jesus has made me righteous because I'm submissive to him. That's not my righteousness. Self-righteous is the exaltation of oneself, thinking I'm better than everybody else because look at what I've done. Think about the Pharisee on the street corner versus the, the uh, uh, publican, tax collector, or yeah, the tax collector uh, in the temple, beating his chest <coughs> saying, Lord, mercy me to sinner. This, tax, or this uh, Pharisee was... was Proclaiming to all who would hear about all the good things he's done. Okay, and to a certain extent, that represents that self righteousness. And people, do people see that in how we act, how we treat others, how we talk to others? Now, sometimes they, they may interpret it when it's not intended, but it just goes to show that we should be very careful. You know, how we deal with people, how we address people, that nobody gets the, the thought process that I think I'm better than anyone else. And certainly, this is important in a society, okay, whether it comes to gender or ethnicity or anything else, but also, especially as it comes to us in terms of Christ, in terms of our soul, that we're not self righteous with others. Could people see that too? And again, none of those are reasons to reject God. Okay, and we'll talk about more about that this morning. But those are reasons why people use to say, this is why I don't want to be a Christian. Because they're all self-righteous. They're all hypocrites. They're all this, they're all that. They do this. Our conduct should be honorable. And that certainly means showing forth what God wants to be shown forth. Anything else through uh, that first half of verse 12? And then, of course, the second half, that they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God. In the, what does that mean? That they, they're speaking against us as evildoers, but the hope is that, by observation, they will come to glorify God in the day of visitation. We need to define what the day of visitation is. Because there, there are those who interpret this as anything from... Uh, the millennial kingdom to different aspects of some kind of holiness or spiritual indwelling in people. What, is, what does Peter mean by the day of visitation? This phrase comes up a couple of times in the New Testament. Every single time in the New Testament this concept comes up, the day of visitation, it represents this, ultimately it's judgment. Okay, ultimately, that's what it's representing. It's representing judgment. But the idea of God, or, or Jesus in this case, coming to us, to take us home, the day of visitation, is this is representative of that judgment day. So what's the goal then? What does Jesus say in Matthew chapter 5? Let your light so shine before men that they may what? So that maybe they can be converted. Maybe they can come to salvation because they observe in you that you practice what you preach. And so as a result, the goal would be that even when these individuals speak against us and speak, speak bad about us and maybe do harm to us, that maybe somehow the seed might be planted so that one day they will, instead of being afraid and fearful and scared of judgment, they can glorify God when that day of judgment comes. Anything else through verse 12? All right. Verse 13. So that's uh, verses 11 through 12 kind of deals with um, how, we, how we live among others, how we uh, show forth our example among others. It's kind of that, uh, that concept. So then as verse 13, though, it's interesting because verse 11, he calls us sojourners and pilgrims. Chapter 1, verse 1, he says we're of the dispersion. Okay, not physical necessarily, but spiritual dispersion. Now, verse 13, he says, submit yourself to every ordinance of man. Wait a minute, I thought you just said that we're sojourners and pilgrims. As such, our home is not on this world. This world is not my home. 
Uh, so why should I be subject to the ordinances and the laws of man? The people in power wouldn't be there if God didn't allow them. Okay, Romans 13 comes to mind with regard to uh, the importance of obeying the laws of man as it pertains to, as long as it's not contrary, causing us to do something that's contrary to God. But Jesus also um, obeyed the laws of man. Yes. Yes, render to Caesar that which is Caesar. Because the question was, should we pay taxes? Yeah, well, listen, you render to Caesar that which is render God what is God's. There, there's a sense of authority there, okay, that, that is recognized. Even Jesus recognized it. Yes, ma'am. Well, we're told to live peacefully among all men. Right. And if we're not obeying the laws of man, then we're going to cause some ruckus. Yes. And so, you know, and, and we're not doing it for our sakes. Right. It says we're doing it for the Lord's sake. That's right. So we're representing him, and he obeyed the laws, and let's keep the peace so people may listen to us when the time comes to speak on behalf of the Lord. That's right. You know, it's interesting because Romans chapter 13, Paul describes, therefore obey every ordinance of man, um, uh, not only for king the king's sake, but also for conscience sake. Okay, this goes to the concept that not only because we're afraid of being caught and given a ticket or something else, but for conscience sake, the fact that, well, okay, the police may not catch me doing this, but who does know I'm doing it? God knows. Yes, ma'am. Well, we're also dual citizens. I mean, I was born in the United States, so therefore I'm a citizen of the United States. Mm -hmm. But I'm also a citizen of Christ. Yes. And so because I have two citizenships, I need to observe the statutes of both when they don't conflict against the grace. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's interesting because when you go to other countries, okay, do those countries, even though we're citizens of the United States, would those countries still expect us to obey their laws? Absolutely. If I go to England and I drive on the right side of the road, am I going to get in trouble? Okay, yeah, I am because I'm expected to obey those laws. Even though I even though my legal citizenship is here in the United States. If I go elsewhere, I am submitting to the laws of wherever I am. So it's, it's the acknowledgement that part of that honorable conduct okay, among the Gentiles is to submit to whatever laws, even if we deem them to be unfair or if we deem them to be uh, obtrusive into our lives. That, and of course, in the United States, we're blessed to have mechanisms by which we can can change laws and we can uh, restructure things if we need to, but we still have to submit to what is law. And that's where, of course, it, with the exception of if what man tells us to do causes us to disobey God, that's where we draw the line. Well, our brothers and sisters in China are a fine example. Yes, they are. Because yeah. they have to break the law and they have to be a little bit sneaky yep. to even to be able to assemble together. Yep. But they're doing... In all other aspects of their life, I'm sure they obey the law. Oh, yeah. Except God's law is greater, and he said a symbol. So they say, we're going to symbol, even if we have to be super careful and put our lives at risk. That's right. Now, and even in that example, though, wouldn't you imagine that our Chinese brethren would have to be very careful to make sure that they're not choosing to disobey other laws and putting it under the category of, well, I'm a Christian, therefore that they have to be very careful that the laws that they break are because if I did so, I wouldn't be able to serve God. Right. Okay, so there, you know, that creates kind of a different angle of issues that we don't deal with in our country that our Chinese brethren probably do have to think about and deal with. But it's still honorable conduct. All right, we'll stop there. We'll pick up at verse 13 and 14 next week. Thank you, everybody.